Welcome to the introduction of basic operation and troubleshooting for the Caterpillar EI-800 electronic unit injector used on the Caterpillar 3500 engine family. This presentation is a generalized introduction of the features, system operation, and troubleshooting basics for Caterpillar 3500 series engines using the EI-800 MEUI fuel system. Some of the features shown and discussed in this presentation are new or optional and are not available on all applications. This presentation is not intended to replace the Caterpillar service manual or other service publications. For detailed troubleshooting information, always refer to the latest service publications. The EI-800 is a mechanically actuated, electronically controlled unit injector capable of delivering up to 800 cubic millimeters of fuel per stroke. This presentation covers four topics. The 3500 engine families using MEUI. The operation of MEUI fuel systems. The operation of the electronic control system. And finally, basic fuel system troubleshooting. Since the introduction of the MEUI fuel system on the 3500 engine family in 1992, the fuel system has undergone many design changes to add features and improve performance and reliability. However, basic system operation and troubleshooting has not changed. This presentation uses a generalized example of a system with the latest features. 3500 engines are available in 8, 12, 16, and 24 cylinder models. The 3500 engine family has both standard and high displacement configurations. Standard displacement is 4.3 liters per cylinder. High displacement is 4.9 liters per cylinder. Standard displacement models include the 3508, 3512, and 3516. High displacement models are offered in a limited number of machine and commercial applications on the 3512, 3516, and 3524 engines. Available horsepower ratings of the 3500 engine family are from 750 to more than 3000 horsepower. 3500 engines are used in a wide range of applications, including machine, industrial, marine, and power generation. The MEUI fuel system was first introduced on 3500 engines in 1992 and provides very high injection pressures and full authority electronic control for optimal engine performance, fuel economy, and exhaust emissions. The MEUI fuel system is comprised of two subsystems, mechanical, and electronic. The mechanical system consists of the low pressure fuel supply system and MEUI injectors. These components produce rated injection pressures of up to 152 megapascals or 22,000 psi and provide precise control of fuel delivery. The electronic control system provides full authority electronic control of all engine functions. Features include electronic speed governing, cold startup mode strategy, automatic altitude compensation, variable injection timing, and engine monitoring and protection. These features result in precise engine speed control, faster cold starting, reduced smoke and emissions under all operating conditions, and built-in engine protection. The MEUI fuel system and electronics are virtually adjustment-free. Most changes to engine horsepower ratings or performance characteristics are accomplished by installing new electronic software or upgraded mechanical components. To repair the system, first identify and then replace the faulty component. All system components, including the injectors, electronic sensors, harnesses, connectors, and electronic control module can be replaced by the dealer. This allows faster repair times 
and eliminates the need to rely on the fuel system repair shop to make component repairs and adjustments. The operation of the MEUI fuel system is quite different from that of mechanically controlled fuel systems. In order to troubleshoot an MEUI system effectively, you must have a basic understanding of how it works. To help you learn the basics of the MEUI system, we'll introduce each system component and then show how these components work together. The MEUI fuel system consists of five major components. Electronic unit injectors produce fuel injection pressures up to 152 megapascals, or 22,000 psi, and fire up to 15 times per second at rated speed. The fuel transfer pump supplies the injectors by drawing fuel from the tank and pressurizing it to about 400 kilopascals, or 60 psi. The ECM is a powerful computer, which controls all major engine functions. Sensors are electronic devices which monitor engine performance parameters such as pressure, temperature, or speed, and supply this information to the ECM by means of a signal voltage. Actuators are electronic devices which use electrical currents from the ECM to change engine performance. An example of an actuator is the injector solenoid. Now that we have introduced the major system components, let's discuss the operation of each component in more detail. We'll start with the mechanical components and then cover the electronic components. Diesel fuel systems use a plunger and barrel to pump high-pressure fuel into the combustion chamber. The cam lobes, push rods, and rocker arms mechanically actuate the injectors. The term MEUI is actually an abbreviation for Mechanically Actuated Electronically Controlled Unit Injector. Major parts of the injector include the tappet, plunger, body, nozzle assembly, and cartridge valve. The nozzle assembly consists of a nozzle spring, nozzle check, and nozzle tip. The cartridge valve consists of a valve body, solenoid, armature, poppet valve, and poppet spring. On 3500 engines, the injector is housed in a one-piece cast bore. No injector sleeve is used. This cast wall of the injector bore separates the injector from engine coolant. The injector nozzle case seats directly on the cylinder head to provide a more positive combustion gas seal. Actuation refers to the type of force used to power the plunger, which pumps the fuel out of the injector. Mechanically actuated fuel systems use a camshaft lobe and rocker arm to provide that force. The rocker arm presses down on the tappet at the top of the injector. The tappet, in turn, presses down on the injector plunger which pushes fuel from the plunger cavity below the plunger. Fuel displaced from the plunger cavity can flow in two directions. Fuel can flow to the nozzle assembly and to the nozzle tip. However, to flow out of the tip, the injection pressure must reach about 38 megapascals, or 5,500 psi, in order to raise the nozzle check against the force of the nozzle spring. The fuel chooses the path of least resistance. It flows around the normally open poppet in the cartridge valve assembly to the fuel supply passage in the cylinder head. When injection is desired, the ECM sends a current to the solenoid on the cartridge valve. The current creates a magnetic field, causing the poppet to close. Fuel flow past the poppet is blocked and pressure begins to build from the poppet, through the plunger cavity, to the nozzle check. When the pressure reaches approximately 38 megapascals, or 5,500 psi, the force of the high-pressure fuel overcomes the spring tension holding the nozzle check closed. The check lifts off its seat, and fuel flows out of the orifice holes in the nozzle tip. This is the start of injection. 
The rapid flow of fuel out of the plunger cavity is restricted by the very small orifice holes. Because of this restriction, injection pressure continues to rise very rapidly, even after the nozzle check opens and injection begins. Injection pressures continue to rise until the flow rate out of the orifice holes equals that of the fuel leaving the plunger cavity. Depending on engine speed and fuel delivery, this pressure ranges from about 69 megapascals, or 10,000 psi, to 152 megapascals, or 22,000 psi. High injection pressures promote complete combustion and lower exhaust emissions. Pushing the fuel through the orifice holes in the nozzle tip causes the fuel to atomize into droplets in the combustion chamber. Fuel droplets burn from the outside into the center. Large droplets take longer to burn and may not have time to burn completely during a normal combustion cycle. Increasing the pressure of the fuel through the orifice holes creates smaller droplets. In turn, smaller droplets burn more completely. There are four stages in the operation of the MEUI. Pre-injection, injection, end of injection, and fill. The first stage, pre-injection, starts with the plunger and tappet at the top of their stroke. The plunger cavity is full of fuel, the poppet in the cartridge is open, and the nozzle check is closed. Fuel leaves the plunger cavity when the rocker arm pushes down on the tappet and plunger. Fuel blocked by the closed nozzle check flows past the open poppet to the fuel supply passage in the cylinder head. As long as the solenoid on the cartridge valve is not energized, the poppet remains open, and fuel from the plunger cavity continues flowing into the fuel supply passage. To start injection, the ECM sends a current to the solenoid on the cartridge valve. The solenoid creates a magnetic field which attracts the armature. When the solenoid is energized, the armature lifts the poppet until it contacts the poppet seat. Once the poppet closes, the flow path for the fuel leaving the plunger cavity is blocked. As fuel continues out of the plunger cavity, pressure builds very rapidly. The poppet transfers this pressure through the plunger cavity to the nozzle assembly. When fuel pressure reaches approximately 38 megapascals, or 5,500 psi, the nozzle check lifts off its seat and fuel flows out the tip. This is the start of injection. Injection pressure continues to build very rapidly until the same volume of fuel pumping out of the plunger cavity sprays from the tip. Injection occurs as long as the plunger continues to move down and the energized solenoid holds the poppet closed. When it decides that injection should end, the ECM stops current flow to the solenoid. This collapses the magnetic field holding the poppet closed. Spring and flow forces open the poppet almost instantly. High pressure fuel can now flow around the open poppet and into the fuel supply passage. With fuel injection pressures approaching 152 megapascals, or 22,000 psi, the velocity of the fuel flowing around the poppet into the 420 kilopascals, or 60 psi, fuel supply passage is very high. This results in a rapid drop in injection pressure. When injection pressure falls to about 21 megapascals, or 3,000 psi, the nozzle check closes and injection stops. This is end of injection. The extremely fast pressure drop from peak injection to end of injection reduces particulate emissions and is an important benefit of MEUI. Let's review the operation of the cartridge valve, which is the heart of the MEUI injector. In order to perform correctly, this valve must be able to open and close almost instantly, seal injection pressures of 152 megapascals or 22,000 psi, and prevent leakage of high-pressure fuel during injection. 
Containing these elevated injection pressures without leakage requires extraordinary manufacturing precision and tolerances. Any high-pressure fuel leaking past the poppet during injection is not delivered to the combustion chamber. The poppet valve opens and closes more than half a billion times during its normal wear life. The ability of the valve to function properly after hundreds of millions of cycles requires more than quality design and manufacturing. This level of durability requires proper fuel filtration to remove microscopic abrasive particles contained in the fuel. Abrasive particles smaller than 10 microns in diameter can cause accelerated wear in any high-pressure fuel system. That is why much finer filtration is being used on modern engines with high-pressure fuel systems. The difference between normal wear and excessive wear on a poppet valve seat illustrates the importance of proper filtration. On the left, you see a poppet valve seat with normal wear after extended use. Notice the condition of the sealing band on the poppet seat. While some wear is present from continued exposure to high-pressure fuel, the sealing band is still in good condition and providing a positive seal. The condition of the sealing band on the worn poppet is the result of abrasive damage from inadequate filtration. The damage to the sealing band is due to abrasive particles in the fuel flowing at high velocity past the poppet seat. This worn poppet seat leaks significantly during injection, resulting in low fuel delivery to the cylinder. In short, a prematurely worn injector. This condition can be avoided using proper filtration. Caterpillar offers high efficiency fuel filters that meet the demands of newer high pressure fuel systems and specifies the use of high-efficiency filters in many applications. Field experience demonstrates that these new filters more than double wear life of both new and old fuel systems over the former standard CAT fuel filter. There's a good deal of confusion regarding filter ratings. One of the more common terms, micron rating, can be misleading. There may be significant differences in the ability of different brand filters with the same micron rating to remove very small abrasives from the fuel. Filter efficiency is commonly expressed in terms of nominal or absolute ratings. For example, a 5 micron nominal filter may only stop 50% of the 5 micron or larger particles striking it. In other words, Every other 5 micron particle may pass through a filter with a nominal rating. Caterpillar high efficiency filters remove more than 98% of particles 2 microns or larger. However, the rating of the filter paper means nothing if the construction integrity of the filter is faulty. In some cases, competitive brand filters constructed with leak paths allow large amounts of all size particles to pass. Caterpillar constructs its high efficiency filters on a completely automated process, constantly testing to assure complete assembly integrity. Why is this fine filtration important? A recent study by a noted independent research agency confirmed that abrasive particles 5 to 7 microns in size cause most abrasive wear in fuel systems. These very fine measurements can be difficult to comprehend. This diagram illustrates the relative size between a single micron and a human hair, which is about 80 microns or 35 ten thousandths of an inch. The smallest particle visible to the naked eye, such as a speck of dust, is 40 microns. Particles as small as only a few microns can cause significant wear due to the extremely high pressures. This example shows the difference in efficiency between a Caterpillar high efficiency filter and a typical 5 micron nominal filter. 
The cat filter removes more than 98% of the 5 to 7 micron abrasive particles in the fuel. The 5 micron nominal filter only removes about half of these particles. This is assuming that the filter contains no leak paths allowing abrasives to flow around the filter paper. Over time, these additional abrasives cause accelerated wear in any fuel system. This includes pump and lines systems that operate at significantly lower pressures than MEUI. Accelerated wear is more pronounced when the fuel contains unusually large amounts of contaminants. Abrasive wear affects all mechanical components, not just fuel systems. A good example of this is link life on track type tractors. Like injector components, track links are made as hard as possible to maximize wear life without sacrificing structural integrity. In highly abrasive conditions, such as pushing sand on a beach, links may completely wear out in as little as 1,500 hours. In very low abrasive conditions, such as pushing wood chips in a sawmill, the same track links may last more than 10,000 hours. Similar contrasts in wear life occur with fuel systems. D11 tractors operating in a coal mine where the fuel contains large amounts of water and dirt average around 3,000 hour injector life. In contrast, other D11s operating in the Canadian tar sands use fuel pre-filtered to as low as 1 micron to remove water and abrasives. Average life on the unit injectors in these tractors is more than 12,000 hours. The same injectors last about four times as long when using very clean fuel. Accelerated fuel system wear can be corrected by removing abrasives from the fuel. One example of this occurred in a coal mining application in Australia. The customer operated 5230 excavators and complained that the fuel injectors were wearing out in as little as 6,000 hours. Subsequent investigation revealed no manufacturing defects, so abrasives in the fuel were suspected. The customer was using the standard Caterpillar 10 micron filter, so many of the abrasives were smaller than 10 microns. Testing the theory, which states very small abrasives are at fault, a test was run by installing new injectors and Caterpillar high efficiency 2 micron filters on four machines. One year later, four injectors were removed from each machine and returned to the factory for testing. After more than 6,000 hours of use, they showed almost no wear. The remaining injectors were left to run an extended durability test. These injectors have accumulated more than 12,000 hours and are still in good condition. These findings led to the testing of the high-efficiency filter in other severe applications around the world. In some countries, fuel lubricity is poor, and the fuel is loaded with very small abrasive particles. In these severe applications, the average life of many unit injectors and excavators has been around 1,500 hours. In extreme cases, Injectors have worn out in as little as 200 hours. Since the introduction of high-efficiency filters in these applications, fuel system abrasive wear has been dramatically reduced. Many former problem machines now have over 5,000 hours of operation with no sign of low power from injector wear. There are many other examples of dramatic improvements in fuel system life using high-efficiency filters. The improvements have been so significant that this filter is now the standard fuel filter for all Caterpillar products. Abrasive particles in the fuel come from several sources. Some refining processes leave large amounts of very small, highly abrasive catalytic fines in the fuel. Large amounts of abrasives can also enter the tank during refueling or from dusty air passing through the tank breather. In dusty conditions, tanks that have very coarse breather filters or no breather filter can allow enough dirt to enter the tank to prematurely plug secondary fuel filters. 
An example of this occurred with Challenger tractors, which typically operate in dusty conditions. In one application, Series 2 micron filters were plugging in as little as 80 hours. This problem was eliminated by installing 2 micron tank breather filters to prevent dirt from entering the tank. This small, inexpensive breather filter increased fuel filter change intervals to more than 250 hours. Optional 2 micron breather filters are now available through the part system and are rapidly gaining acceptance in many applications. In applications where large amounts of water may be in the fuel, a water separator should be used in addition to the primary fuel filter. The use and regular maintenance of a water separator is highly recommended where water contamination of fuel is a common problem. Water contamination is not usually as big a problem in applications that use fuel from tanks with very high fuel turnover rates. It is more of a problem for applications fueling out of stationary tanks with lower turnover rates. Fuel stored for prolonged periods has a much greater probability of generating condensation. A significant cause of injector failure due to plunger seizure is ingestion of large quantities of water in the fuel. All diesel fuel contains some dissolved water, normally about 0.1% by volume. We are not talking about this quantity of water. We're talking about large concentrations in pints, quarts, or gallons generated from condensation or tank leakage. The film strength of the diesel fuel separates the metal surfaces of the injector plunger and barrel. When the film is penetrated, metal-to-metal -metal contact occurs between the plunger and barrel, resulting in plunger seizure and injector failure. Water has a much lower film strength than diesel fuel. Large quantities of water provide very poor plunger lubrication and film strength and lead to injector failure. Some styles of aftermarket combination fuel filters and water separators recommend removing or bypassing the factory installed secondary fuel filter. Removing or bypassing the 2 micron secondary filter is not recommended by Caterpillar. The use of aftermarket filters or competitive brand filters or even bypassing the factory secondary filter does not void the engine warranty. However, abrasive wear resulting from improper fuel filtration is not a product defect and is not a warrantable failure. In addition to proper fuel filtration, it is also important to drain water and sediment from the fuel tank on a frequent basis. In fact, it is recommended to drain the tank daily. This will help to prevent large accumulations of condensation from building up and causing a potential injector failure from water ingestion. Finally, do not pre-fill fuel filters. Pouring dirty fuel into the clean side of the filter allows abrasives in the fuel to damage injectors or cause premature wear out. On most engines, an electric fuel priming pump can be used to purge air from the low pressure fuel system after fuel system maintenance or repair. The electric pump shown here is capable of producing up to 90 psi and purging air from the low pressure fuel system in a few minutes. Over time, abrasives in fluids can cause significant wear to even the most durable objects. Proper filtration is an essential factor in the life of all fuel system components. The fuel transfer pump is a gear pump that pulls fuel from the tank and pressurizes it to about 420 kilopascals or 60 psi to supply the injectors. The pump has an internal pressure relief valve that limits maximum system pressure to 860 kilopascals or 125 psi or less depending on engine model. The hand priming pump located near the fuel filters contains a check valve that allows pumping fuel around the pump gears. The transfer pump is serviceable. Always check the service manual for the correct pump pressure specifications and maintenance procedures. 
Most fuel transfer pumps are located on the rear right side of the oil pump cover. They may be mounted on either the front or back of the front cover depending on engine arrangement and packaging considerations. Two types of fuel filters are available, a canister and a spin-on type. The optional hand priming pump is located near the canister filter or on the filter base of the spin-on filter. Caution! Never pre-fill the fuel filters at installation. Pre-filling bypasses the filter element and introduces dirt into the system. This practice alone contributes to premature system wear. When fuel filters are replaced, there is usually enough fuel in the cylinder heads and fuel supply rails to start and run the engine until all air is purged. However, if the engine will not start or keep running, it will require purging. There are two methods, the manual priming procedure and the use of an electric priming pump. The correct procedure for manually priming the system can be found in the special instruction form number SEHS 9586. This procedure uses a gauge valve assembly installed downstream of the fuel pressure regulator. With the tool installed and the valve open, the hand priming pump is used to prime the system until the air bubbles disappear from the sight glass. The valve is then closed and the hand priming pump used to pressurize the system to 206 to 275 kilopascals or 30 to 40 psi. This allows any remaining trapped air in the system to be absorbed back into the pressurized fuel. After 8 to 10 minutes, open the valve and start the engine. If the engine will not start, repeat the process. Use of an electric fuel priming pump is recommended. The pump is available as a service tool from Caterpillar for temporary installation to purge the low-pressure fuel system after repair or maintenance. It is also available as a permanently installed option on many engine and vehicle models. This pump is capable of producing up to 620 kilopascals, or about 90 psi of pressure, and will purge all of the air from a low-pressure system in a few minutes. The final component in the low pressure fuel system is the pressure regulator valve. This valve is located on the top front of the right cylinder bank and is a normally closed pressure relief valve. The pressure regulator is a spring-loaded valve that only opens when fuel pressure reaches the relief pressure setting. The pressure regulator valve also has an orifice that allows a small amount of fuel to flow through the spool and return to tank even when the spool is closed. The orifice allows air to bleed from the low pressure fuel system after filter changes or whenever fuel has been drained from the head. Some models are equipped with an anti-siphon valve which mounts on the downstream end of the fuel pressure regulator. The anti-siphon valve has a plate check valve with a very light spring. Return fuel flow from the pressure regulator opens the plate check against the very low spring force, allowing return flow back to the fuel tank. When flow stops, the spring closes the plate check, preventing fuel from being siphoned from the engine. MEUI injectors take low pressure supply fuel and pressurize the fuel between 69 megapascals or 10,000 psi and 152 megapascals or 22,000 psi. A camshaft operated rocker arm pushes down the injector tappet and plunger, supplying the mechanical energy required to pressurize and pump the fuel from the injector. The combustion chamber receives pressurized fuel in the correct quantity and at the correct injection timing. The extremely high pressure fuel flow through small orifice holes in the tip causes the fuel to atomize into microscopic droplets that burn more completely. This improved combustion more efficiently uses the heat energy of the fuel, resulting in improved fuel economy and reduced exhaust emissions.
The low pressure fuel system supplies fuel from the tank to the injectors. This system has three basic functions. To supply fuel to the MEUI injectors for combustion, to supply extra fuel flow for cooling of the injectors, and to supply extra fuel flow to remove air from the system. The major components in the typical low pressure fuel system are the vehicle fuel tank, the fuel transfer lines, the primary fuel filter or water separator, the fuel transfer pump, the secondary fuel filter and priming pump, the pressure regulator valve, and the anti-siphon valve. There are often component differences between the fuel tank and transfer pump on different engine arrangements and applications. For example, the recommended arrangement for most engines utilizes a 13 micron primary filter to catch large debris from the fuel tank. However, some applications do not install a primary filter and instead rely solely on the secondary filter. Fuel drawn from the tank flows to the primary fuel filter or water separator. The primary filter screens large debris before the fuel flows to the inlet side of the fuel transfer pump. This is a simple gear pump containing an internal pressure relief valve. Fuel pressure is typically limited to 125 psi or less. The safety bypass valve is not used to regulate fuel pressure in the cylinder head. It is only used to prevent overpressure of the secondary fuel filter in the event of severe filter plugging or downstream return to tank restriction. Fuel flows from the outlet port of the transfer pump to the secondary fuel filter. In the past, secondary filters typically had 10 to 15 micron ratings. Since their introduction in 1996, two micron filters were used as an option in certain applications. By 1999, two micron filters became standard equipment for all Caterpillar engines, including the 3500 family. These filters can also dramatically increase fuel system life on older engines by removing smaller abrasive contamination from the fuel. Some engines are equipped with an optional hand priming pump. The purpose of the priming pump is to refill the system with fuel and remove air from the low pressure fuel supply system after a filter change or injector replacement. The priming pump pulls fuel from the tank around the transfer pump through the ECM and into the filter. It then pushes fuel through the fuel supply rail to each cylinder head. Return flow from each cylinder head flows through the return rail and back to tank. In most applications, an optional electric priming pump is available. This unit is manually controlled and is used only to bleed air from the system after servicing. The electric priming pump is operated by a manual toggle switch or button in the operator's compartment. When the pump is engaged, fuel flows from the tank around the transfer pump into the secondary fuel filter and through the cylinder head. The electric priming pump is capable of pumping up to 2 liters per minute against an 80 psi restriction. This pump will easily bleed the low pressure fuel system on the 3500 engine in a matter of minutes. Fuel flows from the secondary fuel filters to a supply rail on each bank of cylinder heads. Fuel flows through each head and to the return rails. Return flow passes through the pressure regulator valve which regulates supply pressure by restricting return flow. Return flow from the pressure regulator flows through the anti-siphon valve, through a return line, and back to tank. The fuel pressure regulator consists of a spring-loaded pressure relief valve, which opens at approximately 60 psi and regulates pressure at a range of 60 to 65 psi. When the engine is off and no fuel pressure is present, the valve closes. Because the pressure regulator is mounted above the supply and return rails, fuel siphoning through the regulator with the engine off is not usually a problem. In applications where siphoning can occur, an anti-siphon valve is used to prevent the fuel from draining back to the tank. 
The anti-siphon valve has a plate check valve with a very light spring. Return fuel flow from the pressure regulator opens the plate check against the very low spring force, allowing return flow back to the fuel tank. When flow stops, the spring closes the plate check, preventing fuel from being siphoned from the engine. Thirty-five hundred electronic engines use a state-of-the-art electronic control system that has many features and benefits. Although this presentation focuses on major electronic engine component operation, some basic electronic diagnostics are covered in the diagnostics portion of this presentation. The electronic control system consists of three types of components, input, control, and output. Sensors constantly monitor engine operating conditions and relay that information back to the electronic control module. The ECM is the computer that controls the engine. It has three main functions. It provides power for the engine electronics, it monitors input signals from engine sensors, and it acts as a governor to control engine RPM. It also stores engine operating information such as faults, events, and cumulative operating hours. The personality module is the software in the ECM which contains the specific maps that define power, torque, and RPM of the engine. The ECM sends electrical currents to output devices to control engine operation. The heart of the electronic system is the Electronic Control Module, or ECM. This powerful state-of-the-art computer controls all engine functions, providing excellent performance and fuel economy while meeting stringent and ever-changing exhaust emission standards. The ECM provides many electronic features, including full authority electronic engine control, logging of engine faults, improved electronic engine diagnostics, engine monitoring and protection, and many customer programmable features. The ECM has two 40-pin harness connectors. The harness connectors connect the ECM to all of the engine sensors and actuators, including the MEUI injectors, the throttle position sensor, dash display, and data links. This wiring may seem complicated, but it's really quite simple. All of it is made up of many simple circuits. We will cover some of these circuits in the electronic system operation portion of this presentation. Sensors are simple electronic devices that detect and convert a change in pressure, temperature, or mechanical movement into an electrical signal. There are four basic types of sensors pressure, temperature, position, and speed. A pressure sensor measures changes in pressure and sends a variable DC signal voltage back to the ECM. Pressure sensors have three wires. The first wire supplies voltage from the ECM to the sensor, providing power for sensor operation. This supply voltage is precisely controlled to 5 volts. The second wire is a ground wire from the ECM to the sensor that provides a zero volts reference. The third wire is a signal voltage from the sensor to the ECM. This signal voltage varies with changes in the pressure of whatever the sensor is monitoring. The operating range of the signal voltage is slightly greater than zero volts and slightly less than five volts. The ECM also determines if a sensor is shorted or open by monitoring the signal voltage. If the signal voltage is the same as the supply voltage, the ECM knows the sensor or sensor circuit is open. If the signal voltage is zero, the ECM knows the sensor or sensor circuit is shorted. If the ECM senses either a short or an open circuit, it will indicate a fault for that circuit to assist in troubleshooting. For most applications, the key pressure sensors on the engine are the filtered and unfiltered fuel, or a fuel pressure differential switch, filtered and unfiltered oil, 
turbocharger inlet and outlet, and atmospheric and crankcase pressure sensors. A temperature sensor measures changes in temperature and sends a variable DC signal voltage back to the ECM. Temperature sensors have three wires. The first wire supplies voltage from the ECM to the sensor, providing power for the sensor operation. The supply voltage is precisely controlled to 5 volts. The second wire is a ground wire from the ECM to the sensor that provides a 0 volts reference. The third wire is a signal voltage from the sensor to the ECM. This signal voltage varies with changes in the pressure of whatever the sensor is monitoring. The operating range of the signal voltage is slightly greater than 0 volts and slightly less than 5 volts. Most of the temperature sensors on the engine are 3 wire 5 volt sensors which produce a DC signal voltage. These include the engine coolant sensor and after cooler temperature sensors. The exhaust temperature sensors are 3 wire sensors which use an 8 volt pulse width modulated or PWM voltage like the throttle position sensor. The third type of sensor is a position sensor. An example of a position sensor is the throttle position sensor. This sensor monitors throttle position and converts that position into a pulse width modulated signal that is sent back to the ECM. A position sensor has three wires. The first wire supplies voltage for sensor operation. The most common supply voltage for the throttle position sensor is 8 volts. However, some engines use 12 or 24 volts depending on application. Refer to the troubleshooting guide for specific information. The second wire is a ground wire from the ECM to the sensor that provides a zero volts reference to the sensor. The third wire is a signal voltage from the position sensor to the ECM. The throttle position sensor generates a pulse width modulated signal, which is a square wave. A square wave is either full voltage or zero voltage on or off. Duty cycle is the percent of on time. The duty cycle range for the throttle position sensor varies by application, but is commonly from 5% at low idle to 95% at full throttle. Always check the troubleshooting guide for correct information on specific applications. The throttle position sensor transmits this duty cycle signal to the ECM at a constant frequency. This type of sensor provides a very accurate signal to the ECM with a smooth transition during acceleration and deceleration. The ECM determines if the throttle position sensor is faulty by monitoring the duty cycle. If the duty cycle is outside of the prescribed range, the ECM will log a fault. The fourth type of sensor is a speed sensor. The speed timing sensor has a permanent magnet and a coil of wire. A change in the magnetic field of the sensor induces a voltage into the sensor. The ECM reads the increase and decrease in voltage as a signal. As the camshaft gear rotates, signal teeth cast into the gear pass through the magnetic field of the speed timing sensor. The sensor generates a very accurate square wave signal voltage as each timing tooth passes. The ECM counts the time between these signals to determine how fast the engine is running. All of the teeth are evenly spaced except one, which is a wide tooth. This wide tooth sends a longer duration signal, which indicates top dead center to the ECM. The speed timing sensor has three wires. It uses a magnet, coil, internal circuitry, and a supply voltage from the ECM to generate a signal voltage back to the ECM. The first wire supplies voltage from the ECM to the sensor, providing power for sensor operation. This supply voltage may be 8, 12, or 24 volts, depending on engine application. The second wire is a ground wire from the ECM to the sensor that provides a zero volts reference. The third wire is a signal voltage from the sensor to the ECM.
A new type of optional sensor has been recently introduced to help detect when the water separator requires service. The water in fuel sensor is mounted in the water collection bowl of the primary filter water separator. This sensor measures changes in conductivity of the fluid covering the ends of the sensor probes. Diesel fuel has a higher electrical resistance than water. An alternating signal current is supplied to the probes by a sensor control module. The control module is supplied with the sensor and reads the strength of the signal which is passed through the fluid to determine if the fluid is diesel fuel or water. If water is detected, the control module lights a warning lamp in the operator's compartment. The warning lamp will remain on until the water separator is serviced. The water in fuel sensor has two wires which supply an alternating current to both electrodes. This alternating current is used to prevent electrolysis and a metal transfer from one electrode to another. Electrode damage from electrolysis is a common cause of failure of other water and fuel sensors which use DC current. The wires are part of an electronic module which supplies power and detects the presence of water. The module drives a light emitting diode located in the operator's compartment. The optional sensor and module can be installed on most applications to notify the operator when the water separator needs to be serviced. In review, Four basic sensors govern engine operation, pressure, temperature, position, and speed sensors. The speed timing circuit is the most important of all the basic circuits. This speed timing signal tells the ECM the position and speed of the engine camshaft. The ECM requires this signal to govern engine operation. The speed timing signal is so important that the engine will not start or run without it. If the engine is running and the speed timing sensor fails, the engine will shut down. The ECM will discontinue injector actuation without a clear and uninterrupted signal from the ECM. In the event of a sensor failure, the ECM will log both an active and a logged fault. The throttle position sensor circuit determines desired engine speed by sensing the position of the accelerator pedal and sends a pulse width modulated signal back to the ECM. The ECM then compares desired engine speed to actual engine speed, determining how to fire the injectors. The operator selects an engine speed with the throttle. The position of the throttle generates a pulse width modulated signal which the ECM translates into the desired engine speed. The ECM then compares the desired engine speed to the actual speed, determining if the injectors should deliver more or less fuel. The ECM increases the duration of the current to the injectors, delivering more fuel and increasing engine speed if the actual engine speed is lower than desired. If the actual engine speed is higher than desired, the ECM decreases duration to reduce fuel delivery. With less fuel, engine speed drops very rapidly until actual engine speed matches desired speed. The ECM uses many other sensor inputs besides the throttle position signal to determine the correct operation of the MEUI injectors. The ECM must determine three things to control injector operation injection timing or when injection starts, the quantity of fuel injected, and engine speed in order to determine current duration and length of injection. All sensor inputs are compared to the software maps in the ECM and output signals are sent to the injectors. These output signals control actual engine operation. The turbocharger inlet pressure sensor measures pressure downstream of the air filter element and sends a DC signal back to the ECM. Turbo inlet pressure is compared to atmospheric pressure to determine air filter restriction. Operating with excessive filter restriction and a not reducing fuel rate could result in excessive heat and cause severe engine damage. 
the ECM uses the turbo inlet pressure signal to turn on a warning lamp, limit fuel delivery, and derate the engine in the event of air filter restriction. The turbocharger outlet pressure sensor measures turbo pressure in the intake manifold and sends a DC signal back to the ECM. The ECM uses the turbo outlet pressure signal to limit fuel delivery and prevent overfueling and black smoke. This serves the same function as a mechanical fuel air ratio control. The atmospheric pressure sensor measures atmospheric pressure in order to compensate for altitude. It sends a DC signal back to the ECM. The ECM uses the atmospheric pressure signal to adjust timing and fuel delivery, maintaining engine performance and emissions at high altitudes. The atmospheric pressure sensor is also used to automatically calibrate the other pressure sensors. Most 3500 engines have two oil pressure sensors. One measures lube oil pressure before the oil filter, and the other measures pressure after the filter. Both sensors send DC signal voltages back to the ECM. The ECM uses these oil pressure signals to help determine if the engine is operating with low oil pressure or if the oil filter is plugged. Some 3500 electronic engines are equipped with an engine monitoring system that can be programmed to off, warning, derate, or shut down. The ECM will turn on a warning lamp when a low oil pressure condition exists. If the ECM is programmed to derate, engine power will be reduced. If programmed to shut down, the engine will shut down. This shutdown option is not available on earth moving vehicles. Diagnostic codes logged will be low oil pressure or very low oil pressure. The coolant temperature sensor is a three-wire sensor which measures the temperature of the engine coolant. It converts coolant temperature into a DC signal voltage. The ECM uses the coolant temperature signal to help determine proper injection timing and may also use the signal to adjust engine speed. If coolant temperature is below a certain point, the ECM engages the cold mode strategy. Cold mode is an electronic strategy which adjusts injection timing to improve cold performance and reduce white smoke. Engine speed may be adjusted and performance is slightly impaired during cold mode operation due to modified injection timing. When the engine warms up to near normal operating temperature, the cold mode strategy is disengaged and normal performance strategy resumes. The ECM also uses the coolant temperature signal for high temperature protection. Some engines are equipped with an engine monitoring system that can be programmed to off, warning, derate, or shut down. The ECM will turn on a warning lamp when a high temperature condition exists. If the ECM is programmed to derate, engine power will be reduced. If programmed to shut down, the engine will shut down. This shutdown option is not available on earth moving vehicles. There are diagnostic codes for high engine temperature and very high engine temperature. The aftercooler temperature sensor is a three wire sensor which measures the temperature of the coolant leaving the aftercooler. It converts coolant temperature into a DC signal voltage. The aftercooler temperature signal is used to monitor inlet air temperature. High intake air temperature indicates the aftercooler is beginning to plug. Monitoring systems use the high aftercooler temperature signal to turn on a warning lamp. If the overheat condition continues, the ECM will derate the engine. Most 3500 engines have fuel pressure sensors for both filtered and unfiltered fuel. These three wire sensors convert fuel pressure readings into a DC signal voltage. 
Some engines use a differential pressure switch instead of two pressure sensors. The switch senses both filtered and unfiltered fuel. If filtered fuel pressure falls below a preset pressure, indicating a plugged filter, the switch closes, completing a circuit to the ECM. The ECM uses the fuel pressure signals from the inlet and outlet sides of the fuel filter to determine pressure drop across the filter. Excessive pressure drop indicates the fuel filter is plugging. The ECM uses this signal to turn on a warning lamp in the operator's compartment. A D-rate is not used for this condition. An exhaust temperature sensor is located in each exhaust manifold to measure exhaust temperature. These three-wire, eight-volt sensors convert exhaust temperature into a pulse-width modulated signal voltage. The ECM uses the exhaust temperature signals to prevent major engine damage in the event of excessive exhaust temperatures. The ECM will turn on a warning lamp in the operator's compartment when the overheat condition occurs. If the overheat condition increases, the ECM may derate or shut down the engine depending on how it is programmed. The crankcase pressure sensor monitors blow-by pressure in the crankcase and sends a DC signal voltage back to the ECM. Excessive blow-by past the piston rings is an early indicator of wear or possible engine damage. The ECM also uses the crankcase pressure signal to turn on a warning lamp in the operator's compartment. This signal will cause a derate or shutdown on certain applications if programmed to do so. The electronic systems on the engine may seem complicated. However, once you understand how these basic types of sensors work, the operation of individual circuits becomes much easier to understand. Some engines are equipped with a coolant flow switch, which senses whether there is coolant flow in the water jacket while the engine is running. This is a normally open switch, not a sensor. When the engine is running, coolant flow moves the paddle and closes the switch. If coolant flow stops while the engine is running, the paddle returns to its spring-loaded neutral position and opens the switch. The ECM will turn on a warning lamp and shut the engine down. Water separators with water and fuel sensors help to prevent catastrophic damage to the unit injectors by preventing ingestion of large amounts of latent water in the fuel. The water and fuel sensor contains two electrodes in the upper part of the water collection bowl. Diesel fuel has a higher electrical resistance than water, so there is no electrical connection when the electrodes are covered by fuel. However, when enough water collects in the bowl to cover the electrodes, a circuit is completed to the sensor control module. A warning lamp in the operator's compartment is then activated to indicate the water separator needs service. The warning lamp will remain on until the water separator is serviced. Another electronic feature we will discuss is called electronic trim, or E-trim for short. This feature electronically adjusts the performance of individual injectors to reduce the fuel delivery variability of a set of injectors. E-trim is necessary because there is no way to mechanically adjust fuel delivery on an MEUI injector. An assembled injector must fall within a specified delivery tolerance when it is assembled and tested. However, in a set of injectors, the combined delivery variability may cause undesirable idle quality or rated performance. E-trim reduces injector set variability by using a programmed increase or decrease in the current duration to the solenoid when the injector is fired to increase or decrease fuel delivery. The E-trim value of each injector is determined by injector performance at final test. If delivery is higher or lower than the exact desired delivery value, an E-trim code is assigned to compensate for the variability. When the injectors are installed in a new engine, 
the e-trim value of each injector is programmed into the ECM. This feature has greatly increased customer satisfaction and engine performance. When an injector is replaced in the field, a new e-trim value must be programmed into the ECM for that injector. This procedure is explained in the service manual and is discussed in the diagnostic section of this presentation. On the 3500 injector, the code for the new injector is a four-digit code engraved on the injector tappet. Understanding the basics of how the fuel and electronic control systems operate is essential to identifying system problems. The objective of this section is to introduce the basic diagnostic procedures used to identify and correct problems on MEUI-powered 3500 engines. The system used in this presentation is only an example of a typical modern MEUI system. There are many different engine arrangements and applications. However, the basic troubleshooting logic and procedures are very similar for all MEUI engines. Always refer to the correct service manual for the latest repair and diagnostic information. Modern, electronically controlled engines offer improved diagnostic capability over older, mechanically controlled engines. But they are not totally self-diagnostic. In order to troubleshoot an electronic engine effectively, service technicians must have five skills. They must be able to understand how the fuel system and electronic control systems operate, find appropriate information in the Caterpillar service manual, perform basic mechanical tests, perform electronic system tests, and interpret test results to find the root cause of a problem. A good basic understanding of system operation is the most important part of effective troubleshooting. For example, adjustments to horsepower or performance characteristics are made by installing new software, changing programmable parameters, or by upgrading mechanical components. Other than adjusting tappet height, no mechanical adjustments can be made to any part of the MEUI fuel system. Technicians who do not understand how components and systems operate end up guessing at which component to replace. Replacing the wrong component increases customer downtime, repair cost, and customer dissatisfaction. In addition, never disassemble MEUI fuel system components in the field. Disassembly generates thread debris and introduces dirt causing serious injector damage. Unauthorized disassembly of warranty components will result in reduced or non-allowed warranty reimbursement. A second important skill is the ability to use the Caterpillar service manual effectively. The service manual has three parts, engine, troubleshooting, and maintenance. Under the engine tab, you will find three modules, specifications, system operation testing and adjusting, and disassembly and assembly. In the specifications module, you will find torque values, torque sequences, pressure settings, and numerical values for adjustments, such as valve lash settings. In the systems operation testing and adjusting module, you will find explanations of how mechanical systems operate test procedures for mechanical components, and adjustment procedures for mechanical components such as the valve lash settings. In the disassembly and assembly module, you will find removal and installation procedures for major components such as MEUI injectors, disassembly and assembly procedures for serviceable components like water pumps, and disassembly and assembly procedures for the basic engine. Under the Troubleshooting tab, you will find an electrical schematic and a troubleshooting module. The schematic contains location and identification information for engine wiring, connectors, electrical components such as switches and relays, 
and electronic components such as sensors and the ECM. The troubleshooting module contains all of the information for troubleshooting electronic engines. Topics that are covered are troubleshooting, electronic system overview, programming parameters, troubleshooting without a diagnostic code, troubleshooting with a diagnostic code, and a diagnostic code list. In the operation and maintenance guide, you will find maintenance information that is primarily intended for the operator or owner. This guide contains specifications for cooling, lube, and fuel systems, recommended practices for engine operation, and maintenance recommendations such as maintenance schedules and refill capacities. The next important skill is to be able to perform basic mechanical tests correctly. This includes being able to measure hydraulic pressure, use a volt ohm meter to perform basic electrical tests, checking boost pressure and exhaust restriction to determine if the engine performs properly. It is also essential that you use and understand the features in Caterpillar Electronic Technician, or ET for short. ET is required to service electronic engines. With it, you can identify, understand, and correct active faults, logged faults, and logged events. You can also read and change programmable parameters and view status screens. You can perform the injector solenoid test, the cylinder cutout test, and several other special tests that enable and disable specific ECM outputs. In order to better understand these tests, the cylinder cutout and solenoid test are performed and explained in the diagnostic section of this presentation. Finally, interpreting test results to find the root cause of a problem is critical. This includes being able to evaluate component performance of the sensors, actuators, injectors, and associated wiring. It also includes being able to understand how components and systems interact, how components work correctly, and how the system reacts if a component is faulty. These skills are important to be able to quickly identify and correct problems on electronically controlled engines. Only electronically controlled engines constantly meet demands for improved performance, reduced emissions, and improved fuel economy. There are many misconceptions about what electronically controlled engines can and cannot do. A quick review of these will illustrate why the troubleshooting skills just mentioned are so important. Electronically controlled engines can indicate active faults, log faults and events, identify major component failure, and identify sensor and actuator short and open circuits. Electronically controlled engines cannot troubleshoot themselves, identify marginal component performance, or identify inaccurate sensor readings. In short, electronically controlled engines cannot think for themselves. It is your ability to think and understand how engine components and systems work together that allows you to perform effective troubleshooting. Performing the basic electronic tests on MEUI engines is simple. The electronic diagnostic tool used to perform these tests is the Caterpillar Electronic Technician, or ET for short. ET is actually a software package run on a laptop computer. ET can perform the injector solenoid test, cylinder cutout test, identify active faults, logged faults, and logged events. ET can display engine configuration, change customer programmable parameters, flash program new software into electronic engines, and print configuration and test results for further analysis. 3,500 engines are equipped with electronic control modules with replaceable personality modules. Prior to ET, installing new software required ordering and installing a new personality module. This method increased both product cost and customer downtime. 
ET allows 3500B series ECMs to be flash programmed. This method is much faster and less expensive than ordering new personality modules. This example uses ET to demonstrate the basic electronic tests with the screens and cursor commands to perform each test. It does not cover the actual instructions on how to use ET. Specific instructions are available in the Caterpillar Service Tool Software Users Manual for CAT Electronic Technician, form number NEHS0679. The first diagnostic test identifies active fault codes, or active faults for short. Active faults indicate a system malfunction or problem currently present. An example is a shorted or open sensor, wire, or circuit. Let's look at an example. When no active faults are present, the ET screen will read, No Active Codes. If we unplug the oil pressure harness connector, ET identifies this as an open circuit active fault after a few seconds. The code for this fault is 100-03, which ET defines as an oil pressure sensor open circuit. Detailed information for troubleshooting this code is in the troubleshooting guide. When logged faults are not present, the ET screen reads no logged diagnostic codes. The oil pressure sensor open circuit fault has occurred 10 times. The first occurrence was at 3 hours, and the last occurrence was at 27 hours. The diagnostic clock indicates the total number of hours on the engine, in this case, 27 hours. The ECM can remember up to 255 occurrences of a logged fault. If the fault occurs more than this, the ECM will remember the last 255 occurrences. Generally, logged events are not electronic problems, but indicate an abnormal engine condition. Examples of logged events are engine overheat and engine overspeed or high inlet air restriction. These are not electronic problems, but are abnormal operating conditions. The purpose of the injector solenoid test is to make sure there are no open or short circuits in the injector wiring harness and all of the injector solenoids are working. Select the Test All button at the bottom of the screen to begin. ET instructs the ECM to actuate each injector solenoid in order from 1 through 8. This test will continue until clicking the stop button at the bottom of the screen. If a short or open circuit is detected, the fault will be listed on the screen and the defective circuit will not work. The cylinder cutout test measures the contribution of individual cylinders, compares one to another, and determines if any are weak. The automated multiple cylinder cutout test used in ET version 3.3 and later has two options. First is the single cylinder cutout test. This is an optional test because it is the least effective of the three. It is used when trying to identify audible differences between cylinders. The second test is the multiple cylinder cutout test. This test has been the standard test since MEUI was introduced. It controls engine idle speed and cuts out one cylinder at a time. It then compares the relative power contribution of each cylinder by displaying a simulated rack reading for each cylinder tested. A chronic problem with this test has been the difficulty of identifying a single weak cylinder. On multiple cylinder engines with 12 or 16 cylinders, Cutting out a single cylinder makes only a small difference at idle. Performing the cutout test under load would be better, but it is very difficult to maintain a consistent load that would allow the test to measure each cylinder consistently. The preferred test is now the automated cutout test. 
This test achieves an increased consistent load at idle or 1,200 RPM by shutting off multiple cylinders to increase the load on the cylinder being tested. Due to the wide variation of engines and applications, there are several different test strategies that shut off different cylinders in different sequences. The correct strategy for specific serial number prefixes is programmed into electronic technician and is automatically provided. Let's demonstrate how the automated test works using a generalized example of a test on an eight-cylinder engine. The automated test shuts off half of the engine at a time and then tests one cylinder in the running half. For example, the test starts by turning off cylinders 2, 3, 5, and 8. The test then turns off number 6 and samples the injector current duration on cylinders 1, 7, and 4. After the test on cylinder 6 is complete, number 6 is turned back on and the engine stabilizes for 5 seconds before testing number 4. After 5 seconds, the test turns off number 4 and samples the injector duration of the three running cylinders, 1, 7, and 6. After completing cylinder number 4, the process is repeated for cylinder number 7. When the test on cylinder 1 is complete, ET turns on all eight cylinders and allows the engine to idle normally for five seconds. Then it shuts off cylinders 1, 7, 4, and 6, repeating the test sequence for cylinders 2, 3, 5, and 8. This is the recommended test procedure for most applications. The automated cutout test also has some new parameters to increase test accuracy. For the test to work properly, warm the engine to a normal operating temperature. The new automated cylinder cutout will not allow the test to start if the coolant temperature is below the prescribed operating condition. The second new parameter is engine speed during the test. The test is run at a preferred speed of 1,200 RPM. If safety concerns prohibit running the test at 1,200 RPM, it can also be run at low idle. If engine speed is manually changed beyond the prescribed range, the test will not start or will abort if in progress. Accessories that put an intermittent load on the engine should be disabled during the test. Air compressors, fans, or other devices which can cycle on and off will add to test variability if they cycle on and off during the test. ECM-controlled cooling fans are turned on and left on throughout the entire test. The automated cutout test begins by the technician setting engine speed to the requirements stated on the ET screen. Once selected, this speed is maintained throughout the test. If it is changed, the test will abort. The ET software then turns off five injectors at a time. The remaining three cylinders must then produce more power to maintain the programmed idle speed. After the idle has stabilized, the ECM measures the average duty cycle of the solenoid current to the three working injectors. The ECM then assigns a test value to the injector being tested. This cycle automatically repeats for each injector. Listen to the sound of a test on a properly operating engine. In order to reduce test variability and make it more accurate, the test repeats two times and the results averaged. Once all eight cylinders have been checked two times each, test values are assigned to each cylinder. The ET software completes the calculation and identifies which injectors are okay or not okay. If a new injector is installed, the E-Trim code for the new injector must be programmed into the ECM. This is easily done with ET. First, go to the ECM summary screen shown here. Then select Service, 
Calibrations, Injector Codes Calibration. Select the cylinder number in which the new injector was installed. In this case, it was cylinder number 3. The code shown for cylinder 3 was the E-trim code for the previous injector. On the 3500 injector, the trim code for the new injector is a four-digit number engraved on the injector tappet. Double-click on Cylinder 3, and the Change Parameter Value screen appears. Enter the E-trim code for the new injector and click on OK. A follow-up screen will ask for confirmation that the new code is correct. Click Yes, and the new code is programmed into the ECM. This is all that is required to enter a new E-trim code for a replacement injector. A review of the most common customer complaints reveals the actual cause of the problem. Many injectors replaced under warranty are returned to the factory to determine the cause of failure. The process used to evaluate returned injectors is warranty analysis. This process consists of three major steps. The first step is a complete visual inspection. This inspection looks for signs of external damage caused by the following problems. Burned solenoid terminals from loose connections. Loose solenoid terminals from over-torquing. Injector tip or nozzle case damage from engine overheat or improper assembly. Rust or signs of water ingestion from the fuel supply. Damage from improper injector removal, parts handling, or return shipment. The next step is a thorough injector performance analysis. This includes running the injector on a performance test bench at both idle and rated speed and fuel deliveries. This ensures that the injector actually operates correctly under all operating conditions. The final step is a teardown analysis on any injector that does not pass all visual and performance test standards. Parts are inspected for defects using the most modern inspection equipment available. This includes microscopes, electronic roundness and surface finish machines, and even a scanning electron microscope where necessary. This equipment is capable of finding even microscopic flaws and defects. In fact, the scanning electron microscope can magnify the surface of an object up to 20,000 times. It is used to identify inclusions that cause failures and locate the origin of cracks. Here, a sulfide inclusion in a piece of material is shown at various magnifications. In order to preserve evidence of a failure, it is very important that the failed pieces be returned exactly as they were found. If you are ever requested to return failed parts to the factory for analysis, do not clean the pieces or put them back together. Cleaning or reassembling the fracture surfaces destroys evidence which can pinpoint the failure. Wrap the pieces individually in soft paper towels and return them in the same box or envelope clearly marked for identification. Results from the performance, teardown, and failure analysis are compiled and reviewed by both engine and fuel system engineers to determine root cause of problems and necessary corrective action. Problem resolution teams address emerging problems where corrective action is unknown. Let's look at some of the most common customer complaints listed on warranty claims and their actual root cause. The top four customer complaint categories comprise over 80% of all 3,500 MEUI injector warranty claims. They are no information, low power, misfire, and fuel in the oil. Each of the above complaints is a description of the problem. Just a few root causes are responsible for most of the complaints. Let's look at each one in more detail. No information is the single most common category of claim received, accounting for about one-third of all returned injectors. The term no information means that the claim was received without a claim story or customer complaint. However, 
These injectors are thoroughly analyzed and various root causes identified. The most common condition found is poppet erosion resulting in low power. As discussed in the fuel filter portion of this presentation, abrasives in the fuel damage the poppet valve sealing band in the injector cartridge valve. This results in leakage of high-pressure fuel across the damaged seat during injection and loss of power from reduced fuel delivery. More than one-third of all returned injectors were damaged by abrasive wear. The second most common condition found is no fault. This means that the injector had no visual defects and passed all factory performance tests. In short, the injector had no defects and did not require replacement. One third of all injectors returned were no fault. The automated multiple cylinder cutout test should help this problem because it positively identifies which injectors are acceptable. Slightly less than one-third of all 3,500 MEUI returns with no information consisted of a variety of minor internal defects or component failures. These failure modes are identified and have either already been corrected or are actively being addressed by problem resolution teams. More than two-thirds of all injectors returned with no information were either damaged by abrasives in the fuel or were no fault. The second most common customer complaint is low power, which accounted for nearly one-fourth of all injector returns. There are several root causes of low power. More than half of all low power complaints were due to poppet leakage from damage by abrasives in the fuel. This problem could be dramatically reduced with proper fuel filtration using two micron high efficiency filters. There is no mechanical defect or failure mode that affects an entire injector set. Degradation of an injector set is usually caused by an excessive amount of abrasives in the fuel, which cause premature poppet wear and leakage. Remember, abrasive wear resulting from improper fuel filtration is not a product defect and is not a warrantable failure. Using recommended filtration, such as the Caterpillar high-efficiency filters, can prevent this type of wear. About one-third of all low-power complaints were caused by actual injector defects or failed internal components. These failure modes are identified and have either already been corrected or are actively being addressed by problem resolution teams. The third largest root cause of low-power returns is no fault. These account for one-eighth of all injectors returned for low power. The third most common customer complaint was misfire. This complaint accounted for slightly more than one-eighth of all injector returns. The largest root cause of misfire was miscellaneous defects or internal component failures. These accounted for slightly more than one-half of all misfire returns. These problems typically occur after extended use and usually result in a symptom of an intermittent injector misfire. Through warranty analysis, problem resolution teams identify and resolve these problems. The second most common root cause of misfire was no fault. These accounted for more than one-third of all misfire returns. This means that the injector had no visual defects and passed all factory performance tests. In short, the injector had no defects and did not require replacement. The final failure type identified in injectors returned for misfire was poppet erosion from abrasives in the fuel. These accounted for only about 10% of misfire returns. Poppet erosion results in low power but does not cause misfire. In this case, the customer complaint did not match the failure mode found during testing. The fourth customer complaint category was fuel in the oil. This category accounted for only 13% of all returns. More than half of all returns for fuel in the oil were no faults. The remainder were defects of internal component failures. All known injector failure modes combined account for about two-thirds of all returned injectors. 
This demonstrates a significant improvement in dealer diagnostics over the past several years when no faults accounted for about two-thirds of all returns. Resolution teams are actively working to or have already resolved all injector failure modes. In addition to improved injector design, you'll see a rapid evolution in fuel filtration across the product line. No faults account for about one-third of all injectors returned. This category represents our biggest opportunity to reduce warranty claims and improve customer satisfaction through improved diagnostics. This is the driving factor behind the automated multiple cylinder cutout test and the development of improved training methods such as this presentation. You can help reduce no faults by looking for external causes of misfire, low power, or rough running. These include checking injector connections and wiring for clean solid contact, checking inlet and exhaust systems for restriction, checking fuel supply pressure to assure that pressure is adequate and the secondary fuel filter is not plugged. Finally, make sure customer expectations are reasonable. Some customers have expectations for performance which are simply beyond the capability of an engine or fuel system. In these cases, replacing injectors as defective is counterproductive because it reinforces the customer's impression that the parts were actually defective. This concludes the introduction to fuel system operation and troubleshooting of MEUI-powered engines. Understanding how the engine systems operate, how to perform basic diagnostic tests, and where to find service information will help you improve reliability and make it easier to troubleshoot and repair 3500B MEUI engines.